So Seamus, have you ever played Kingdom Come Deliverance? I have not. I have hear about it all the time, and I can't even, like, sort of the discussion surrounding the game has always just sort of passed through me. I've heard the name a bunch of times, and I know it's got a picture of a guy in a suit of armor on the cover, and nothing else has stuck. It just sort of washes over me, and it's, you know, my brain filters it out as white noise. I don't even know why. I don't even know if it's bad. I just don't know. <laughs> My brother played it a while ago, and he's like, man, this is such a great game, you got to play it. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll keep my eye out for a deal or something. And then it was free on the Epic Game Store. And I was like, oh, perfect. This is months ago. And uh, so I picked it up, but I never actually played it. So today I was like, all right, I've got some free time. I'm going to sit down, going to install this game, play some Kingdom Come Deliverance. So I go to the Epic Game Store, and uh, it says unavailable. Like normally, you know, there's a whole list of games and you click on it and it's like play or install or whatever. And this is just unavailable. It had a little like circle with it, a little line through it. But you own it. I mean, you got it for free, right? Yeah, ostensibly. Um, but you can't like you can't click on it because it's unavailable. And you like you can't go to the you can go to the store page and they offer to sell you a copy again for 30 bucks or whatever. Um, <laughs> it doesn't say that you own it on there at all. So there's no indication of why it's unavailable. It doesn't say like unavailable on your platform or unavailable unless you pay again or anything. It's just like, no, it's not, it's not available. It's it's actually just not, no, it's emotionally unavailable. The game just doesn't have time for Distant. you right now, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not feeling it. <laughs> I don't wanna. The game itself has found more interesting games to play. <laughs> The game has transcended the need for a user. It's like in Reboot. Oh, that's weird. Like, how does that even happen? It's unavailable. I should fire... I yeah. should remember to fire up Epic once a, once a week to get my free game and to see if any of my existing games have become unavailable. No, so I searched online. I was like, "What's what's up?" Because of course, there's no like help menu in the Epic Game Store. There's no way to to get <laughs> so support. Uh, that's one of the projected features. Um, it, it'll be available by late 2027. So you just need to stop being yeah. such a hater, Paul. Steam projected wasn't perfect in the psychological it... sense. Right. Steam wasn't perfect when it came out. So therefore, you can't complain uh, about any missing features in Epic. Well, I can't complain about any missing features in Google either because no one seems to know why this happens. There's several people asking, like, why is this unavailable? And no one has any answers. So uh, then I was like, all right, well, what's the free game for this week? Maybe I can just play the one that's free this week. So I downloaded Into the Breach, which I also, another of my brothers played and said it was great. Um, but by that point, I had spent all my free time, so I didn't actually get to play it. Huh. Well, that's disappointing. While we were talking here, I just became the proud owner of Into the Breach. Although it's from the I, it's from the um, creator of FTL, so I don't think I'm going to care yes. for it. Oh, I really? really, I enjoyed oh, FTL. I mean, it wasn't, I hated FTL. It wasn't the best game, but oh, really? Uh, now you're not allowed to say it's too random number generated. Uh, you, you'll just get yelled yes, at. Yes, I've read the, the comments game. on your site. Yeah. You are not allowed to say that because it's not randomly generated. Once you master all the systems of the game and know everything, and you memorize how all the events play out, then you have control of the situation. Okay, for a new player just trying to figure out how to play this fucking video game, I have no idea and no connection between cause and effect. And I press buttons and I get the opposite of what I thought was going to happen. And I'm worried that Into the Breach will be more of that yeah well i don't know i, I didn't get it to play it so I, I can't say anything about it but um it's not I just random. actually i it's... opened up epic game store again and now kingdom come deliverance says that i can install it so that's odd that's novel yeah so more hijinks <laughs> well it's a good thing you have infinite time to spend on video games Oh boy, I wish I had more. I just got back from a couple of weeks in um, Albuquerque and uh, working in a clean room again. And uh, you've worked with cable tracks before, right? Uh, what's a cable track? Like where, remember back in the old days when 
when you had like a mainframe and then you had all the little consoles everywhere and you had to run all these cables everywhere and so you bunched all the cables together and like ran them all together in a in like a, a track like a trough of some kind oh oh you mean doing things the right way um yeah we we rewired the entire building um, you know for network not electricity uh the company i was working at back in 93 and we just sort of had the cables lay, they just sort of went up into the ceiling tiles and then converged above the main frame with no <laughs> pattern behind them. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. So it was like in, in System Shock then? Yes, like showed in with all those wires coming in to make her hair. Oh, to be fair, we're only talking about probably a dozen computers tops. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, this was not a Well, it was a big office. There were lots of people. But, you know, not lots of people using computers. Most people just had isolated PCs and crap like that. People, anybody that used a PC, th there was no network for them. They just sat at their unconnected PC. The only people that had network access were people using dummy terminals on the mainframe to process orders. And there were like a dozen people. So the people with PCs had like a dot matrix printer sitting there on their desk or something for when they wanted to actually use output? Oh, only if they were, you know, only if they were a company executive. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, oh, it was... Yeah, it was not... Um, even at the time, it was not an advanced company. It was a small... It was a small and very industrial-oriented company. They sold... Um, like pneumatic and hydraulic fittings and valves and to they may have even built them somewhere like maybe it was they built them I don't know we worked in the main office where they processed and the, this was not the consumers this was like a bulk manufacturer of that crap so yeah not cutting edge okay so but when you were up at, under in the ceiling tiles there was just like dust everywhere right you know, I don't remember how that worked. It's funny, I spent like two weeks doing that job, and I don't remember what it looked like above the ceiling. I think we got up there with a ladder. There wasn't enough room to crawl around up there. It was a drop ceiling, so you couldn't like, it wouldn't support you. Yeah. But how did we get the cables across the ceiling? I don't remember. Just throw them really hard over the wall? I don't know. <laughs> I guess. The places I've worked before where we've got a bunch of network cables, they're all run in a in a cable track. It's like a um, a wire. It's got uh, solid walls on the side, but then the bottom is just like a bunch of rungs, kind of like a ladder lying down. And then you've got a right, bunch of these right. cables running down there. And then you zip tie them onto the rungs. Um, and then you do this out in like a big warehouse or something. And then you just like don't touch it for 10 years and then you need to go change something you go up there and there's just like a quarter inch of dust lying on top of everything. And like every time you touch it, it disturbs the dust and it's just like a huge mess. Oh, that's horrible. Oh. Or it's like running in a, um, an E-chain, like an energy chain cable carrier for like a, a big robot or something. And the robot is cutting carbon fiber. And so there's just like this deep pitch black dust coating everything and then in, it gets trapped inside a cable track and so then like you open this thing up you got to pop the covers off and it's just like it's like carbon dust in there oh so the most surreal thing for me working in a clean room was one they've got just a nigh infinite number of cables they've got like cable tracks on top of cable tracks because every machine has a network cable, and the facility is just packed with machines. Wow. It's like a data center, except for, like, that makes the chips that goes into data centers. It's just, like, network everywhere. And the cable tracks are perfectly organized. Like, you know, the, the perfect parallel lines, and then, like, you know, things are splitting off, and single lines, and, you know, everything stays organized, and there's no tangles anywhere. It's just, like, pristine. 
Yeah. And because it's a clean room, there's no dust anywhere. And so it's just this really surreal experience of like, what is this? Like this, like from from a CG picture or something. Like, how did I get here? What what is going on? <laughs> right. Right. I can I can see what you mean. Where it looks like, oh, this looks fake in the real world. If this was a real photograph, this would have a bunch of dust and fingerprints and scuff marks all over it. But no, this looks like you just like you just made it in blender. This looks made up. Oh, how do they? I mean, if you've got a process that creates tons of dust, these cables, I assume, go into the clean space. They, they no, they're in the clean through. room. Right, but they go from one way or the other. They go through the outside to the inside, correct? Now they've got whole data centers inside the clean room. But the data center itself has got to connect. Oh, but that can, that, that's probably. Yeah, just it does. There are, through, there are through ports in the floor. Uh, if you look, like, the whole thing is on a raised floor. So you know how you've got a, like a drop ceiling, like you were talking about, where there's the real ceiling right. and then there's the drop ceiling that's kind of acoustic or whatever. This has got like a raised floor. So you've got the real floor, and then about two feet above that, you've got this big grid of tiles that you actually walk on. And then down below that is all the pipes and stuff like that. Um, we, and then there are holes in that the bottom floor that go through and those holes are all sealed up So you've got like pipes coming up through these big holes, maybe like manhole size But then they're completely sealed with like I don't know what it is rubber or something some sort of or like silicone or something They just like cast a giant old plug of silicone right around all the pipes so that it's completely sealed Wow That would be surreal I've never seen anything like that yeah, it was we, a strange place. We had an elevated floor at the the place I worked at at 93, and it seemed sort of pointless. You know, it had it had a lot of infrastructure cables. I don't think the network came under the floor. The network went through the ceiling, but under the floor was power and connections between the the mainframes or whatever. And it was a nightmare down there. No organization. It was just like this nest of cables. And it was right. super dusty and nasty. But, I mean, the the machine was literally, like, the size of a washing machine. It was a washer-dryer set, basically. Like, the mainframe was the washer, and the hard drives were in a big dryer-sized right. case. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, that total storage is less than, like, a thumb drive. Like, a crappy thumb drive from ten years ago. It just no comparison. Yeah. It's ridiculous. In both storage and bandwidth. Right. Oh, it was so slow, it was painful. But so much faster than punch cards. Yeah, that was definitely before my time. Actually, punch cards were just... They, they kind of finished up just before I, you know, entered the workforce. So I'd hear people talking about, oh, you know, a few years ago, oh, it's all punch cards, and boy, we're glad to have that behind us. Oh, wow. Well, I don't know how to segue. There's one more tiny topic, and then we'll go to mailbags. Um, I was trying to log into, what was it? It was Discord. Somebody was like, hey, join my Discord channel or whatever. I was like, all right, cool. And so I tried to log into Discord, and it's like, we noticed you're logging in from a new location. We sent you an email. If you don't want us to harass you all the time, you could enable two-factor authentication. And I was like, hang oh. on. Like, you want me to give you my phone number so that you can no doubt sell it to spammers or whatever. So that you won't harass me by sending me an email. You'll instead harass me by sending me a text. Right? I'm like, I'll take the text. Oh. Yeah, I, I, that's the reason I won't use two-factor authentication, is everybody, I mean, they need your phone number to make it work. And I just, no, I don't trust any of you yahoos with my phone number. In fact, the bigger and the more, more prestigious the company, the less likely I am to trust them with my phone number. Like, the, you know, if it was just some local, you know, some guy on the street corner running, I don't know, like, I don't interact with small business, but if it was, there's some guy downtown selling computer parts or fixing computers or something like that, I'd give that guy my phone number. But if he was part of a chain, I wouldn't. 
It's the big companies you can't trust. Because they will sell that in a heartbeat. Right. I still oh, yeah. I I switched up my phone number a few years ago and this phone number I don't trust with anybody. It was so nice that the spam calls stopped. Brand new phone number, spam calls stopped, and I refused to go except there's one spammer got my phone number. And it had to be from a big company. Um and they they still call me. They call me about every two days. Hello? Awkwardly long pause, then a recording of a woman's voice. We've been trying to reach you about your car insurance. And then a bunch of foul language that I'm not going to repeat here as I shout into my phone at the dumb machine. <laughs> and then I block and report the number as spam. And then two days later, of course, it's a totally different number, but the exact same recording. Yeah, I get those all the time, too. Just random like spam calls. Block and report, what else can you do? Yeah, and two-factor authentication is just like, risk that, that nightmare, sending me a, you know, a phone call that breaks my concentration every couple of days, versus the get a text message only when I'm doing something with a new advice. I mean... The, the actual, the the positives of two-factor authentication are just not worth it. You know, I just use a password manager, have huge passwords that are unique to every site, and just don't worry about two-factor authentication. It's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah, same here. It, it, does, it, it does drive me crazy when they do the, we recognize a login from a new device, and it's like, no, you don't. This is the same physical computer on the same physical IP address, but a different web browser. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have access to the cookies that we put on your computer. Right. That's exactly it. That's all it is. And it's like I, I, a lot of this, I feel, has to be just trying to push as much of the work on to users like hey I've got a hacked account problem oh you're done using two-factor authentic it's just a way to sort of like shove as much of the hassle onto the user yeah and to be fair there are a lot of people out there who are not careful about their accounts and, and passwords and it's things true. it's true especially when you're running it at scale there's just million literally millions of people yeah it would just be nice if there was a way, just like with Windows, where I want a checkbox where it can be like, I know what I'm doing, don't bug me. I want, I right? want that for all software. I want, to, I want to be able to opt in to, I'm a responsible adult and I know what I'm doing with my computer, I'm tech savvy, and I don't want you trying to hold my hand. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, let's do some mailbags. Yay! Alright, I'll take this first one. Uh, this is actually kind of old. This is, this was supposed to be two weeks ago we were supposed to do this one, but... You know, uh, you've been wasting so much time on the show that, with all your talking, that uh, we didn't get to it until now. I know. You lose Patreon subscribers every week, probably. <laughs> right. Specifically, complaining about how much talking Paul does. And Seamus, you should try to get a word in edgewise. <laughs> all right, seriously. Uh, hello, Seamus. Hello, Paul. Yesterday, I saw Young Yi's video. Okay, this is referring to um, the story from a couple weeks ago where Bloodlines 2 got pushed back again. This thing was a, originally slated for March of this year. This was one of my... My thing back in 2019 was, oh my gosh, March is going to be super crazy in 2020. All the games are going to come out, and literally every one of them. There was like five, I think, and they've all been delayed by a lot. Like, most of them still aren't out. I think Doom Eternal came out, and that's it. I think that's the one that actually came out. And, uh... So this and the the story from a couple weeks ago is Bloodlines has been delayed again, and the two creative leads are both gone. Oof, yikes. And, yeah. And it's like, this is late in the development process. What? Okay. Um, so this is a guy from Ubisoft, which is already setting off alarms. I mean, 
Ubisoft is creatively bankrupt. The, the corporate core of the company does not care about art or story or any of that. They see their games as mechanical products, and if somebody wants to shove a story into one of them, well, that's, that's good. The developers can do that if it keeps them amused, but they do not care about narrative generally. Oh, I should say this was this email was from Lars. Thank you, Lars. I didn't read the email because it's kind of long. I, it will be in the show notes for those who want to read the whole thing. Um, so yeah, this is the thing I'm curious about: is you fired the two creative leads? What? The game should have been out by now already. What possible? benefit could you get by firing the two creative leads there must have been a huge i mean imagine that this is like the game must be in the home stretch of development and you're going to take those people out of the project and give it to a new person who has had no connection to the project he's some corporate guy that just Man, it sounds like a political decision to me. Right. Right. It sounds very much like a political decision. Like somebody doesn't like somebody or somebody may angered the wrong person kind of thing. Because it makes no sense creatively. I mean, even in Hollywood, it's like, oh, wow, we really hate this director. He's pissed us off. All right, let him finish the movie and then we'll give him the beat. We'll, you know, we'll give him the boot and we won't invite him to any of the press for the game. You know, we'll just sort of shove him out of the spotlight and we'll stand in it and soak up the credit. That's how you do it in Hollywood. You don't wait until the movie's nearing post-production and then yank it away from the creative lead and give I mean, that happens, but it's rarely good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like last resort, which is possible, I suppose. I haven't watched or been following any of the Bloodlines 2 stuff. Has there been any media coming out, like real gameplay footage or anything? Oh, we got some in E3 in 2019, but nothing. I haven't seen anything new this year. Mm -hmm. And this is such a weird decision. And Ubisoft, they've had uh, a bunch of other scandals that aren't worth getting into about just the leadership acting like jackasses and they've got harassment problems and everything. But in the midst of all that, you're going to give these two creative leads who are, you know, really, really interested in the Bloodlines universe. You're going to give them the shove and hand the game off to some suit from corporate. This is going to make the game a pain in the ass to analyze. <laughs> If it's not a great game, if it's like deeply flawed, then you're going to be like, what? Is this a result of the original story was terrible, or was this a good story that was then mangled by someone meddling? Yeah. I don't and know. if it turns out really well, then it's like, well, what happened? Why did they. You're, you're, the right. guy who they put in here is never going to get the credit if it turns out well. So it's like, right. why even bother? I mean, and the. It's frustrating because I want to speculate about it right now. Like, you could, we can imagine scenarios all the time. Like, Ubisoft came in, hey, we want to put in microtransactions and unlock characters and pay money for the good ending. And, the, you know, the creative leads were like, no, man, get out of here with that. And it was like, too bad you're fired. And I'm going to do that to the, that could happen. But we have no proof of that. We have no, that's just a made up story that fits our narrative. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's hard to say. We're never going to know the truth. Let's get that expose guy in there, whatever his name is. Right, Jason Schreier. Get him in there. Give him uh, some glasses and fake mustache. <laughs> Groucho glasses. <laughs> How do you do, fellow developers? <laughs> Dear Diecast, the YouTube algorithm did something good and recommended to me a retrospective on the Steam controller. The thing I found most interesting is that apparently gyro aiming is nearly as precise as mouse aiming. As of now, only the Steam, Switch, and PlayStation controllers contain gyroscopes, and there are no plans to add them to the Xbox, so many developers don't bother. Since the Steam controller flopped pretty badly, how do you think controllers might evolve in the future? Do you think there will be an ever huger and there will ever be a huge push to bring more accuracy to game controllers? Regards, 
RFS81. Thank you, RFS81. So I did not watch the linked video. I meant to, but it slipped my mind. I actually love the Steam Controller in concept. I like holding it. I like having it. I, I like immediately like, boy, this is a neat little device. But then it comes time to play a game and I'm like, all right, so do I want to use my mouse and keyboard or my Xbox controller or the Steam controller? Well, no, I don't want to use the Steam controller. The game is either optimized for the Xbox or for the mouse and keyboard. And so I never have a reason to use my Steam. I actually have two of them. I bought one and then oh, man. Uh, and then somebody I knew gave me one. They were like, I never use this thing. <laughs> so now I've got two Steam uh, controllers yeah. I don't use. I didn't even know about the gyro. Th I didn't even know it had gyroscopes. I thought the whole thing was that touchpad. Those big circular touchpads you've got. And I assumed all aiming was handled through those. But if the game doesn't support gyro... So I assume gyro aiming is the thing from the place the first time we got it was the playstation 3 had gyros in it that could tell which you know the six axis controller where it could tell as you tilted it around which sounds like it could be interesting oh you could use that for aiming but no it was never that precise for aiming and sometimes you do it try flying or steering or something with it and it was always super floaty and imprecise and you know, it doesn't sl snap back to normal, so you'd have to hold it perfectly level if you don't want to, like, go be going in circles. <laughs> like, yeah. if you're, like, leaning back on your couch, l up on one elbow, <laughs> then you just won't worry. You'll just be driving in circles because you can't get it level or it'd be uncomfortable to do so. And so what happened with the first six-axis controller is the only thing anybody ever used it for was shake the controller real fast. Oh no, the bad guy grabbed you. Shake him loose. And you just shake the... Then you just take the controller in one hand and kind of flail it around and, and your character shakes loose. And then you go back to, you know, playing the game using buttons. <laughs> so mm, that was the right. six axis. It was like a reverse rumble pack. <laughs> <laughs> You, you shake the controller to make something happen in the game, and then you make something happen in the game, and then it shakes your controller. I don't know. Uh, so I always had a terrible opinion of gyros, and I had no idea they were good for aiming. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I haven't watched the video either, but uh, being nearly as precise as mouse aiming sounds like the kind of thing that happens when you've trained with it and, and carefully tuned your abilities for that device. It doesn't sound like, to me, it doesn't sound like the kind of thing where it's like, oh, well, you just pick up the Steam controller and, and it's just as good as a mouse if you're used to using a mouse. Right, and almost as good is also means not as good. <laughs> so if you're playing on a PC, you're going to reach for the mouse because you want to use the most optimal tool for the job. So again, right. and that's you're sort already of... used to it because you're using it for everything else. It's not like you're right. writing an essay in on the Steam controller. So that leaves the Steam controller in this weird limbo between the two, where it's like not as good as a regular Xbox controller for console type games, and not as good as a mouse and keyboard for PC type games. It's like this awkward combination between the two that you probably already have the two alternatives, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I why would you use never, the Well, not never, but I very, very rarely use a controller. I'm strictly mouse and keyboard, because that's what I use all day for everything else. And so it's like, well, if I'm going right. to play a game, like, the, here they are. They're already set up. It's already on my desk. Like, I, I'm not going to... I don't lean back and relax on the couch to play games. I'm, like, at my computer. So, um but I have used Steam controls before. My uh, some of my friends have them for, especially for playing multiplayer games, where everyone wants to be able to watch the same screen and you know do the the same thing at the same time. And it's really nice to have this very compact interface device that's for you know controlling games. But at the same time, it seems like a Xbox controller would be even better because 
you don't have all the bells and whistles. It's just a game controller. It doesn't have to be an extra input device with all the haptics and all that stuff on it. Huh. I don't know if it is or not. I, like I said, I, I very, very rarely use a controller. We have one. I think my wife got it for playing Hollow Knight. Right, right. Yeah, there are a few games that just really do, but you don't play those kinds of games, so... Yeah. Yeah, not generally. There are some... Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to play Batman on a mouse. I'm sure you can do it. I'm sure there are people who are fantastic at it. But that would feel wrong to me. That would feel awkward. Play like a Batman Arkham game or this new Spider-Man game on a mouse and keyboard. All right. Dear Diecast, this one is for Seamus. I don't know if 2D beat-em-ups are your thing, so I was wondering whether Streets of Rage 4 is on your radar because I think it might be up your alley. It's perfectible. It does the Arkham Asylum thing where it tracks how much damage you deal without getting hit. It has tons of difficulty options um, and judo throwing enemies into one another. So yeah, basically I just wanted to show for a game I like. Regards, RFS81. So thank you, RFS81, again, for two questions in a row. Uh, so here's the thing with 2D beat-em-ups. I haven't really... I, I tried River City Girls recently. I think that's what it was called. It was just a couple of anime... It, I liked the trailer for it. It was some anime girls at one of those anime high schools where nobody ever goes to class and everybody just hangs out in the hallways all the time. <laughs> and their boyfriends get kidnapped. And they have to go save their boyfriends by just brawling through room after room of enemies. And I loved the humor. And it was really fun and playful. But I wasn't really super into the combat and I, I don't know if it's perfectable or not the thing is my um, perception of this style of game is really been tainted by the ones I played in the early 90s you know this sort of game is 30 years old and the first ones were all deliberately designed to not be perfectable because it wants to eat as many quarters as possible you're in an arcade yeah. And, and so it always made the games feel kind of shallow and dumb. You're, you're just, your coins are just fuel, right? <laughs> to keep it going. Yeah, and, and they're full of gotcha moments and stuff you have to memorize yeah. and avoidance things. like Kind of like a bullet hell, only you can't move up and down very easily. Right. And I played... I played quite a bit of them back in the day and I never felt like I was getting better. It wasn't like... Oh boy, when I started out, you know, a quarter would last me a minute, and now they last me ten minutes. It's like, oh, when I started, my my first quarter was, you know, a couple minutes, and now a quarter gets me a couple minutes. <laughs> it just, it, it didn't feel rewarding. It didn't feel like I was mastering a game. It just felt like I was fueling it with money. And so that perception has always lingered on the genre like every time I see one I think uh, a quarter muncher even though obviously it's on a PC I'm not really shoving quarters into my exhaust fan of my, <laughs> of my <laughs> PC well there might be so, DLC who knows right right but it, it might be time to like give the um, the genre another look I didn't stick with River City Girls long enough to like know if I was getting better at it or if I really understood the systems of the game. I was just sort of like, oh, that was fun for 10 minutes, but I think I'm done now. I also have never been big on, on brawlers or 2D beat-em-ups or anything. Uh, I mostly play by myself, so I'm not in the position to be fighting against other people in that kind of game, which seems like that's the the primary, I don't know, it seems like that's the primary thing that, that's the draw nowadays is is going up against other human opponents. Um, and then, like you said, all the other stuff was quarter munchers. And so it's like, well, you can play those games now on GOG or whatever, but <laughs> you've just got to like continue. You've got a continue button and you just mash that right. thing and, and waltz your way through it. So that's not really an interesting challenge either. Right. Yeah. Those games are like too expensive to play and too expensive to like learn to play well. I mean, they, they've done them on, uh, like, what what's the 
the speedrunning charity called that I'm blanking out on now. Games Done Quick. I believe somebody did the Simpsons game on Games Done Quick, and I know they've done the Turtles game. And those were two staples of like early or mid 90s brawlers. And so I, and you know, they, oh, yeah. they don't. They, they've got a bunch of those on there uh, Metal Slug. Right. And uh, what was the other one? That was the, the cowboy one that was always in the pizza parlors. Man, I miss pizza parlors with ar with arcade games in them. I don't miss much about ah. the past, but that was good stuff. That was good fun. Anyway, um, wait, pizza parlors and arcade games. That seems like that'd be a little early for you, Paul. Like that stuff was on its way out just before you were born. Oh, well, I live in a small town. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Skating rinks with, with arcade games, and they had a bunch of those. Yeah. Hi! That's, that's not how you do an intro. All right, we'll let it pass this time. We all know that there's a tendency to make fun of gray-slash-brown shooters, often of the military nature. But in more serious note, is there some artistic merit in going with this aesthetic? Maybe any of you have an example of a game with this aesthetic that you like? Best regards... Deadly Dark. So I have one example. I kind of like the brown aesthetic in the original Borderlands game. That you, The game took place in a desert. You kind of had this Mad Max feel to it. And the game was originally made to be brown, and then they did that last-minute art switch where they made it you know, look more cartoony. But the music had a lot of those... I don't know what you call the particular kind of guitar it's generally played single notes very slowly lots of slide notes um steel guitar you know, i i think that's what you call it steel guitar just that evokes a desert um and they had that so it was part of it was a holistic part it wasn't like brown is more realistic it was like this is a oh, artistic choice that is holistic with the rest of the game and for borderlands 2 they introduced new areas like it wouldn't make sense to have a snowy mountain that's brown <laughs> right so <laughs> so every area got kind of its own feel but i and i i like the the more colorful version better but there is something really good about Borderlands 1, artistically. Maybe maybe it was a little too brown. I think it could have used a dash of color to make here and there to make us appreciate the brown more. You know, so it wasn't just all contrasting. It would be like, you know, something to catch your eye occasionally. To drive home just my how brown it favorite, is. I think my favorite uh, brown game is Curse of the Ober Dinn. That That can be brown if you want. It has the whole it has the whole rainbow of Hercules monitors colors. You can play it in amber, you can play it in in black and white, or you can do green. I feel like there's one more uh, two bit monitor color that I'm not thinking of. Maybe blue. I know nobody ever yeah. made red monitors. <laughs> that would be so horrible. <laughs> Just look like the. The, the horrible um, Nintendo 3D VR headset thing <laughs> from the mid-90s. I was thinking like Dr. Claw, right? You're sitting there in the dark with this red monitor, a cat. Oh, that would be so headache-inducing. I was just thinking like Oberdin is, it's got that sapia tone feel. Like it feels old and it feels like it should be in kind of like browns and beiges. Right, right, it does. Oh, yeah, if that game was... In fact, I have trouble imagining that game in any other art style. Like, Borderlands art style? No, that wouldn't work. No, that wouldn't work. Like, the, you need the visuals to go along with the drawn maps and the drawn pictures of individuals. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and you just couldn't do... It's all you'd have yellow to go for, parchment. Right, you'd have to go for photorealism or something ridiculous to, like, work with those pictures. I don't know what you'd have to do. I think the way they did it is the best way to do it. You just see, like, a, a trailer of for Curse of the Oberdin, and it's all, like, Master and Commander footage. 
Imagine, you imagine booting it up and it looks like Crisis? I'd be like, this is so wrong. Dear Casters of Die, with the recent release of Project Cars 3, once again, a, once again, a to me beloved franchise got changed in a big way to attract a larger audience. Ah, oh, I, I feel you. I feel you there, um, Norbert. Uh, but lost what made it special in the process. Now there are numerous examples of where that happens. Mass Effect, Fallout. Mass Effect 1 to 2, Fallout 2 to 3, Rainbow Six to Lockdown, Ghost Recon to Advanced Warfighter, Need for Speed Porsche to Underground, to name a few. Now it seems like I always fall under the category of fan until the franchise was spoiled. And I never encountered a franchise that did not interest me until a sequel came along that fundamentally changed it, that made me suddenly like it. So did it ever happen to you guys that a game franchise that was initially not for you changed to suddenly cater to your tastes and sensibilities? Uh, regards from Austria, Norbert Col Coleus Radis Lick. Lick. Um, that was more, I made that name sound more challenging than it was. <laughs> It's not that hard a name, Seamus. I don't know why you messed it up. Ah, uh, so I didn't even know about Project Cars. Like, I'm, I've just heard the name, but I don't know what its deal is. But yeah, this is a common thing. This is such a common thing. And the question is an interesting one. So, so did it ever happen to you guys that a game franchise was initially not for you changed to suddenly cater to your tastes? I think what you should really look like is... You've got a game that focuses really well on a niche. It's got a group of people that love it. The only way to make it appeal to a larger group of people is to water it down. You have to make it less of what it is naturally. So it's not so much that... Uh, my example here is Civ V. Civ V is much more accessible than the other Civ games. You don't have to know that it's a easier, but not just easier, less complicated. Um, you don't have to... Uh, you don't have to know the mechanics as deeply. You can get by with just simple understanding of the surface mechanics. That's, I think, the best way to say it. There's less tactical, you know, grid-based combat. The combat's very perfunctory. Mm. And I liked it because I didn't like all those things. But I sort of recognized at the time, this is... The things that are better for me are worse for the hardcore fans of this series. <laughs> and it's not like it pivoted to me. It just focus less on the it wasn't making something especially for me it was just making something that could be enjoyed by a gr larger group of people and that's the only example i can think i have this same experience like i love a g i love the arkham games oh i guess we're done with that I guess we're making something else forever now, and nobody's going to be doing the arkham thing oh i love the original mass Effect. oh no they're done with those too Oh, I really like the 2D Fallout games and the tone and the sensibilities and the role play. Oh, no. All choices are valid now in the later Fallout games. Auto leveling everywhere. Builds don't mean anything. Um, okay. How about The Witcher 3? <gasps> You're right. Why didn't I think of that one? That's That should be my first, the first one on my list. And, you know, I don't know the earlier Witcher games well enough to really, to really... You haven't made understand. it through that video essay yet? I, I'm, okay, there's Joseph Anderson's, what is it, is it four hours? Yeah, it's like four and a half hours. Four and a half hours on the Witcher series, and I'm about halfway through Witcher 2 in that, in that, in that, I, I call it a series, but it's one video. Oh, it's two, isn't it? He did Witcher 1, and then he did Witcher 2. And, like, the Witcher 1 video was, like, two hours, and the Witcher 2 was four hours. So, I guess Witcher 3 is going to be six hours now. <laughs> uh, you're right. Although, 
I did not hear. I'll be interested to hear in the comments. I'm so glad you brought this up. For those of you that were fans of Witcher 1 and 2, did Witcher 3, like, turn you off? Was it a turnoff? Did it felt like it had gone too mainstream or too casual for your tastes? The, what I remember is that it was just a more polished experience. And everybody seemed to be fine with it. Everybody that I remember talking about it. Um, the the earlier games had combat that was mostly timing based and that was a little weird and the combat in Witcher 3 is very much just mainstream melee combat perfectly serviceable it's not the best melee combat ever made but it's perfectly serviceable I'm glad you brought that up I, uh, otherwise I would have gotten raked over the coals <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't really have any examples of my own, but I was like, I thought Seamus really liked the Witcher 3 and like didn't like the previous did. one. So, Yeah, that, and that's it. As I think now everything in Witcher 3 was just more... Po this is my take on it. It doesn't feel like they turned their back on their original audience. It feels like they just got way better at making video games. Now, maybe there's some hardcore Witcher 1 fan out there that you know, really misses something about the early games. But my general impression of what people were into felt like the big improvement to Witcher 3 was just more polish across the board. So it wasn't like they were turning their back on anybody. Dear Paul Shepard and Seamus Vakarian, the internet DM is brimming with rumors about a Mass Effect trilogy remaster. What are your thoughts? Also, are you looking forward to Bioware's inevitable attempts to patch up their clumsy retcons and putting Javik's face all over the Promethean statues on Elos? Stay safe, Mako. Thanks, Mako. Mako, you have always been one of the most underrated vehicles in a role-playing game. Much respect. <laughs> so, I'm... I'm kind of miffed because I know I'm going to buy this thing, but I don't want to play through Mass Effect 2 and 3 again. I just want to play, I just want a way to freshen up Mass Effect 1, you know, just an excuse to go through the game again. Um, so I'm cool with, I'm, I'm cool with the remaster. Uh, yeah, I'm a little nervous that they're going to, they're going to try and change, my, my fear is that they will change Mass Effect 1 to try and legitimize the bullshit in Mass Effect 2 and 3. Like the oh, loyalty, yeah. the loyalty within the company is now totally to Mass Effect two and three, and nobody cares. I mean, statistically, no, f the most of the fans don't care about Mass Effect one. A huge number of them. I, I found out years ago. I like had this angry rant on what I think Mass Effect two, two did wrong, and I had so many people arguing with me that no, this all makes sense, you haven't been paying attention. And then I realized they hadn't played the first game and didn't care about it. And they didn't have any, you know, notions about what this game should be about. They were just like, they just thought of it as any other sequel. Like, oh, this is, jump into this series. It wasn't like supposed to form a coherent story. It, this was supposed to uh, yeah. build from Mass Effect 1. So... Statistically, everybody's loyalties are to the latter two games, and particularly the, the middle game. And so, I'm worried that... Okay, my big worry is the elusive man will be shoved into Mass Effect 1. Really? You're not worried that Kai Lang's going to be your tutorial partner? Oh, the elusive man and all of his attendant problems, which, Kai, which okay. would include Kai Lang and infinite armies and and humans being the best at everything in the galaxy like all of that crap i'm worried that, that, that somebody will find it irresistible to mess with that my hope is that this is just a refresh of the graphics yeah just like final fantasy 7 wait <laughs> all right Final Fantasy 7 is like... Oh. 
which by all accounts it was an improvement, but it wasn't just a graphical refresh. Right, it really wasn't. So I'm curious, I'm as curious as everyone, I'm a little nervous that because I'm just gonna buy it and play Mass Effect 1. Um, and I'm a little worried they're gonna mess with, with the parts of the game I liked by introducing a bunch of bullshit that I hated in the later games. Dear Diecast, what do you think of rubber banding AI? Where the AI grows stronger or weaker depending on your performance. Some people say it's it, it's good because it means the game is always challenging you, while at the same time not throwing up any insurmountable challenges. I, however, don't like it since it feels like no matter what I do, I always barely win. So why try to play it at 100% when 80% will do? With kind regards, Chris. Paul, I have talked an awful lot, even by the standards of this show. Please tell me what you think of rubber banding AI. Hate it. Uh, me too. <laughs> oh, I hate it. Hate it so like bad. You, yeah, like Chris says, it's not a is not a genuine challenge. If if there's a way for me to get the challenge I want, that's perfect. Like. I like lots of difficulty options. I like to know what kind of challenge I'm facing, what kind of things I'm going to be asked to do. I want to be able to practice so that I can perform at my best when I'm asked to. Um, but if the if the target's always moving, and sometimes the target jumps to catch your arrow, and sometimes it jumps out of the way just because you've been hitting the bullseye too much, it's like, well, I, I'm not demonstrating my skill. The target's demonstrating its skill in in seeing where my arrows are going. Right. For me, it's like, if I'm getting fit, okay, I'm going to go around this track, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go for a run and go around this track to get in shape. And on the first day I'm in bad shape, you know, I haven't been exercising, eating too much ice cream and I can just make one lap around the, the, the track. And then I'm just like, pass out, <laughs> collapse at the side of the thing. So then the next day I go out and I make it well around once. I make it around again the next day. Just one lap. That's all I ever do is one lap. And I realize that the more fit I am, the bigger the track gets. The circle I run around right. just gets bigger and bigger every time. So that no matter when I, you know, if I become a, an Olympian athlete, if I become Captain America, I'll still only be able to do one lap. It'll just be, you know, the lap is now the size of Nebraska. Right. I hate it because you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. You're not mastering assist. And in fact, why should I bother getting in shape? I'll just walk the fucking thing every day. <laughs> in fact, although you're creating... that that raises an interesting point, if you could see what the difficulty level was, there would be an incentive to do better because you'd be like, oh, I'm now at level, you know, like S ranks or whatever. Right. I had this same problem with control earlier this year. The game is constantly fiddling with the difficulty level. But it won't show you what... If it would at least show me what difficulty level I'm currently on in the menu somewhere. Like, how intense are the monsters right now? Then I would know, oh, hey, you know, I was sort of hovering near, you know, level 2 difficulty or whatever. But now I've got it all the way up to max. Okay, I'm getting better at the game. It feels like I'm not. But the numbers, Sam, that would at least be something. Yeah, because that is kind of what you do when you're running, right? Like you start off running around the block and then like you work up to running marathons. But and like you're still beat at the end of it. But you can say, hey, I ran a marathon. But if it's like right? running blindfolded and no one gets to see the track, it's like, well, how do you know how well you're doing? Right. I'm, I'm sitting there talking to Usain Bolt and he's like, how many laps can you do? One. How, many, how about you? Oh, yeah, one. And it's like, it means nothing. <laughs> Wait, which laps are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so I would, I would appreciate rubber banding more if there's more transparency in right. what it is that it's adjusting to and, and what the level is currently set at. I, I just, even then, I still find it a horrible system and even knowing it exists puts me off a game it is the opposite i want to master a system i don't want the system to just pull back push back perfectly 
no matter how hard I push, it pushes back exactly that hard so that I feel like I'm running in place. That just, it denies me the entire reward I get from mastering a game's mechanics. And, oh, it's awful. It's awful. And it's just an excuse for like, well, what do we do about balancing the game? Well, how about we don't? What if we just didn't? <laughs> <laughs> How about we don't do our jobs and just relax? Let the computer do the work. Right? If it kills you, then it makes it easier. And if you kill it, then it gets harder. And then it's balanced for everybody to be the same bland experience, no matter how good or bad you are. And you don't ever get better, and you don't ever gain anything. You don't ever get anywhere. And you know what? The industry was bitching so hard about used games. Oh man, it's no fair. People would like buy our game and then return it four days later. And you know, it just be feeds the pawn shop. And this is an excellent area where you could improve on that. Make a game that's worth playing for more than three days. Like, there's no reason for me to go play Control again. I'm not gonna like, wow, I remember when I was so bad at this game and these f fights were so hard for me, but now that I've mastered the systems, it's a cakewalk. Like, I'm gonna go, if I go back to the game, it'll feel exactly like it did before. And, uh... Yeah. yeah. So why and, wouldn't I... It, well, and especially for Control, the only other draw is the graphics. And because they were cutting edge at the time, they're not going to be cutting edge forever. Right. Right. So then you've got the story, which, all right, that's that's good. It's It's got some charm, but, you know, that's not enough to keep everybody to hold on to the game. But, you know, there are some games that I would never... I mean, we can't sell games anymore anyway. The pawn shop idea is dead. But... Or at least on the PCs, but you know, give us give us something that makes us want to keep the game and keep coming back to it. It'll strengthen your brand, but you know, you got to make a game worth playing and getting good at. This is it's sort of frustrating that everybody has Dark Souls as the one game that's doing that, and that's sort of like this horrible indictment of the industry. Is oh, here's one game that like will allow you to get good at it. <laughs> well, to be fair, there are a lot of uh, more puzzly games, like uh, all those Actronics games that are sure, sure. very skill-based. But yeah, th there aren't very many first-person, third-person, immersive story-centric games that also don't use auto-leveling because they want everyone to be able to play it and get to see their cool ending that they wrote. Right, and it makes everything so... Bl oh, that's the other thing, is auto-leveling foes that's even worse because then if you build your character sub optimally the game gets harder forever and you can't fix it yeah <laughs> and if you get find a really optimal thing then it's like you can't find a bigger challenge everywhere you go it's everybody's your level why are there levels in this game it's pointless well we've got one one mailbag left and it's so cool but i don't know if we're already over time i don't know if we want to tackle this this week let's live dangerously because i i i do want to comment on this one dear seamus and paul i don't know if you saw the project Athia's engine procedural generation video sorry i couldn't find a direct link but here's a link i can't i can imagine that the upfront work must be amazing but once it's ready I can see this really speeding up the level design process by an order of magnitude. It's basically a professional version of that procedural town building game that you were talking about several shows ago. Uh, this is the kind of tech that always strikes me as being done as a proprietary tool. Uh, same as No Man's Sky. I'm talking about individual marketplace, uh, you know, Unreal Unity. Um, given that every company individual in the industry being highly covetous of their IP could this ever happen that we have a tool like this available for everyone? All the best. Do away. I kind of skipped over some of your question. Do I? Sorry, but it, it was a bit long. Okay, so this... For those of you who haven't seen the video, I will, of course, have a link to it in the show notes. Uh, it's basically... You take a... Tur you know, what I saw of the demo, you 
create you know, a landscape. Oh, here's some, I'll put mountains here. And you don't have to draw the mountains by hand. You just say, I want a mountain in this general area. And I want a forest around here and whatever. And then you, you go on the map and you say, you know what? I want a town here. And you click there and boom, you get a town. Like, I want a road around here. And it will, it will style the landscape to match the idea of there being a road there. The game I thought of when I saw it is it looks like the most recent... Oh, what was that? It's, it's a game about fighting the Mongols. I forget what it's called. I didn't play it. It was a PlayStation exclusive. It just came out. Um, you know, this really... Is me, uh, the sound of me looking confused like I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry. Right, right. Uh, I know. I, I can't even remember... The name of the show. The, the name of the game. Ghost of Tsushima. Oh my goodness. Um, all, I literally typed PlayStation Fight Mongols into Google and it knew exactly <laughs> what I was looking for. Um, yeah, th this game, it looks like it's something that you could build this game with or an Ubisoft game. It has to have a very particular art style. Or you, you're probably aiming at something vaguely photorealistic-ish and open-world nature. Uh, I think this would not help you if you were making a platformer like Fallen Order or Tomb Raider, or it would be a very limited help to you, because designing platforming challenges requires a human being for now. Does it, though? It seems like you could write a set of rules that creates an interesting platforming chain, especially in 3D, where you can wrap them over each other. Um, an interest... I think you could make a a working platforming thing, but platforming is also very much about aesthetics. Like, you get to the top of this cliff, and you stand up, and you've got an incredible view at the end of your climb. Things like mm. that. Or you've got some interesting challenge halfway up or it leads to some kind of puzzle it's it's very much you could fill a lot of game space with auto generated yeah 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 you just use your climbing rope and climb up this tree and then jump over the wall like it could do simple stuff like that but it and maybe you could just sort of fill out you know oh here's two minutes of platforming for you Auto-generated platform, and that wouldn't be too bad. But sooner or later, it needs to fit in with puzzles and story beats. And most of those games are too heavy on puzzles and story beats to get around a lot of auto-generated content. It's certainly not as easy as making a road for the, you know, you just draw a line on your map and it's like, oh, okay, I'll make a dirt road and done. Like the, the logic to make a platforming challenge would be far more complex and the thing is I've been waiting for this for years I mean literally decades I thought it was any minute now like I was working on ideas like this at active worlds uh, that would have been like 20 years ago and I thought oh someone else is doing this way better than I could ever do it this is gonna happen and nobody in my company was ever really interested in it it didn't really serve our customers. I just thought it was a cool thing to work on. And I was always trying to convince somebody that, oh, no, we should do this. It would be great. And everybody's like, nobody, nobody needs that. Nobody's asking us to build that for them, so there's no money in it. And it, they could have been totally right. And But then I thought, you know, we moved away from from that, and I moved away from that job. But I thought, any minute now, somebody's going to be working on proc gen level design. Any minute now, any man, here we are decades later, and it's finally sort of happening for one genre of game. Considering how expensive games have gotten to make, it seems weird to me how long this took. And looking at this uh, article, it seems like this is a, a world generating or world editing system that they've developed that they're using to make a pre generated game in. So it's not even like a procedurally generated world, it's just like some proctin tools that you can use to make world editing easier. 
Right, right, yeah. This isn't a proc gen game where it's different every time. This is just automating the the task of like, okay, if we're going to have a road, roads need, roads tend to be level. You don't have a road where, you know, the left side of the road is much higher than the right. So you need to level out the road, and that means fussing with the terrain on either side of the road. You know, maybe an embankment on one side, slopes away on the other. Or just smoothing the entire terrain. Then, you know, shorten all the plants and stuff on either side of the path because big tr people won't let big trees grow there. That, you know, anytime something gets too big, they'll chop it down because it starts to block the road. So, stuff like that, where you just, like, scroll to a new part of the map, fuss with the topography, change the texture to road, fuss with the, you know, plants and stuff and gets rid of a lot of of tedious busy work which you know would really help like your red dead redemption type games where it is just paths and and hills and trees and stuff seems like it would very much benefit that type of development where there's a whole lot of time sucking non creative work to do and then once you get the tools really good, it does seem like you could just have a, a higher level procedure that runs right. them automatically. And now you've got a, a proc gen thing again, only it's a really good work looking world instead of Minecraft kind of looking thing. This is something I'm more, this is the project I've been not talking about yet, but I am going to start. In fact, as soon as this show is over, I'm going to start writing about it. I'm working on <gasps> proc gen uh, first person levels. And trying to make ones, like, I was never happy with the ones in Strafe. Strafe is a proc gen game, but you could feel the prefab pieces fitting together. And yeah, there wasn't a lot yeah. of stuff Same in the Yeah, same with Dungeon Siege, where it was right. these pre-built blocks that, it was cool how they could chain them together, but after a while you're like, oh, I see, this is that stair room area. Right, and I didn't want that. I did No prefab crap. Um, it's got to be like generated environments different every time that look plausible and are filled with items and c cool lighting. And I don't know if it's going to work, uh, but you know, I'm on week three and I have really promising results and I'm going to write about it. So everybody will get to see my work soon. Yay. And I believe at this point we have indeed done a show. In fact, I think we've done 1.25 shows. <laughs> All right, thanks for all the questions, everybody. We are now caught up. The mailbag is empty, so if you've got a question you want answered, now's your chance. The email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say see you later, Paul. Oh, man, I was going to say see you later, but then you're like, no, say see you later. So now I'm going to have to say goodbye or something. I don't know. I don't know. Say toodles. Toodles? No one says toodles. Toodles. Toodles.